Okay, so let's get started. So uh, welcome everyone. And this is the uh, last session of today's workshop. And we are very happy to have Tomasz Prozen from University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. And he's going to tell us about exactly solved models of many body quantum kills. So Tomasz, uh, could you start? Thank you. Thank you. So first, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to speak in this uh, interesting workshop. Uh, I'm very sorry I cannot be in Japan at the moment, but I hope I'll be able to visit Japan again soon. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, as, as announced, the title of my, my, my talk is on exactly solved models of quantum antibody chaos. Uh, I try to first give you some slides of motivation, even though I'm going to give you a sort of a overview talk of the last you know, progress in particular from our group uh, in the last couple of years, also in, also in relation to some other work, but I would stress essentially the uh, three pieces of the results that came from our, <coughs> our group in the last couple of years. And uh, the basic motivation, so these are the two heroes which are co-responsible for this progress, uh, Bruno Bertini, who was a postdoc with, our, uh, with me, and uh, Pavel Kos, who was a PhD student. Uh, <clears throat> so, and uh, the main motivation for me, I mean, uh, I mean, of course, uh, motivation is sometimes very personal, so uh, it's probably hard to share. But still, for me, it's uh, being kind of trained in dynamical systems and chaos theory in the early 90s. For me, is uh, you know, it was always kind of when I was amazed about about many body physics and many body dynamics in particular. Uh, I always missed models which are like caricature, exactly solvable models of many body dynamics of chaotic many body dynamics. Like you know, uh, these models <clears throat> have been you know used to teach uh, chaos theory and dynamical systems in single particle quantum uh, chaos. Let's say Baker maps and cat maps, Arnold cat, and so on. So I, I was missing this type of type of uh, simple paradigmatic models which you could solve exactly and still would be like uh, uh, would have all the features of, of, of many body chaos, uh, whatever that means. So I will also try to define what what I mean by many body chaos because this is something that also maybe has slightly different meanings depending on the context where people discuss it. So uh, well, there are three things that I would like to kind of overview in during this talk. Uh, one is uh, uh, a simple proof of random matrix spectral statistics in uh, a class of quantum lattice systems, so infinite uh, uh, many body systems with uh, local interactions. Um, <clears throat> then I will try to uh, present even simpler feature of these models. Uh, I mean, these models have to do with the concept which we termed dual unitarity, which is a particular feature of many body dynamics, which allows us to treat many body dynamics uh, equivalently being either in space or in time. So, I mean, we, we have a lattice and for us, the important point of this lattice would be that this lattice is space-time lattice. So uh, as far as, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, not only that space will be discrete, but also, also time will be discrete. So if you want, I will consider Floquet dynamics. Um, and then the idea here is that I'm able to switch to flip between space and time. And I have equally, uh, uh, I mean, uh, dynamics in space is as unitary as dynamics in time. So this feature, of course, seems to be highly fine-tuned, but I'll try to convince it is not so much. And uh, <clears throat> and as as much as and, and as soon as you have this feature, you can you know say a lot about this this this, this type of dynamics. And uh, the simplest feature that you could uh, the simplest property that you could show is uh, exact computation of two-point functions, dynamical two-point functions, which allow you to classify yeah. dynamics into uh, what people in dynamical systems would call an ergodic hierarchy. Uh, and then in the last part, I would like to present some new ideas uh, on uh, structural stability of this sort of chaotic many body dynamics. As you will see, these dual unitary systems allow us to define what one would like to think of as maximally chaotic or ideally chaotic dynamics. And then the, the, the obvious question is uh, how structurally stable that is if you introduce perturbations. And uh, here again, I think one needs to discuss this in very general terms, but I think we have good hopes, at least intuitively, that this dynamics is, uh, is structurally stable in a sense that, uh, you know, again, so I will make an analogy for people who have some background in dynamical systems. Uh, there is this notion of the structural stability of hyperbolic flows of, of dynamical systems. 
Um, and I, I kind of have a, 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 let's say, more or less a gut feeling that uh, chaotic many body dynamics also in quantum many body setting might have similar features. So this is very different from, let's say, uh, integrable dynamics, right? I mean, you just think of uh, <clears throat> chaos and ergodicity is a phenomenon which should be kind of a stable, a structurally stable because it's everywhere, right? If you have a chaotic and ergodic system, if you shake it a little bit per third parameters, it should remain chaotic and ergodic. This is very different from integrable theory since integrability is, on the other hand, uh, re related to some phenomena which are very structurally unstable, like conserved, conserved charges, right? As soon as you perturb integrable theory, conserved charges are gone. So, I mean, in that sense, this is a theory without conserved charges, so maybe it can be structurally stable. I mean, this is just to motivate um, my excitement, let's say, on this topic, but uh, I hope uh, in, in, in future we can prove some results. And this PRX that I mentioned in the, at the end, uh, of this of this point, I mean, this was kind of the first sort of very partial result in this direction. I will try to describe it if the time permits. I'm still not sure. Maybe I will not have enough time, but if time permits, I will describe this results a little bit in the end. Uh, and I also would like to, you know, this is a, a virtual talk, so I, I have little interaction with the audience. So please, uh, if there is anything unclear, interrupt me and ask. I, I guess also in the beginning, maybe uh, in the middle of the talk. I mean, not only at the end. So please. Just interrupt me and uh, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, let me just start from some historical uh, conjecture, which uh, for me again personally was very inspiring. I mean, this is the so-called quantum chaos conjecture. Some people call it Bohigas con conjecture or BGS conjecture. Uh, it is a simple conjecture, which is uh, uh, you know at the beginning was extremely surprising. I think to people who who, who start working on it on, on these systems. I mean. And the idea is that chaos, classical chaos, systems which are chaotic in the sense of Yapun of, uh, or a butterfly effect, uh, classical, I mean, which are chaotic in classical limit, their quantum spectra should behave uh, as predicted by, uh, you know, the statistics or correlations within quantum spectra are predicted by random matrix, matrix theory. <clears throat> so, I mean, not only that complicated systems like nuclei are described by random matrices, as was envisioned by Wigner, for example, but also much simpler systems like billiards, as long as they have chaotic dynamics, are described by random matrices. And uh, these are typical figures that you know would appear in papers of the 80s and 90s, where people would study this type of billiards. They would quantize the Helmholtz equation. They would solve the Helmholtz equation that is quantized, uh, quantized uh, drum, if you want, a microwave resonator, or, or, a, or a particle in a, in a, in a, in a two-dimensional two -dimensional potential. Uh, and uh, the spectrum uh, would have uh, correlations, let's say, level spacing distribution, which would be described by the inner Dyson distribution of a random matrix theory. And if the spect if the billiard would be irregular, like this one, like a circular billiard, uh, then the spectrum would be described by, 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 by Poisson distribution. For example, level spacing are simply exponential distribution. I mean, this is uh, known also as Berry Tower conjecture. <clears throat> Uh, so what I will do in the first part of my talk, I will just uh, describe a simple theory, a simple, no, first I will just describe some intuitive ideas, how one can describe uh, spectral statistics in terms of dynamics. So in order, in order to do that, one has to relate spectral statistics uh, to dynamical quantities. And for that, it's very useful to start from the simplest correlation measures. And these are two point functions, like uh, pair correlation function of the spectrum. So we start, and in order to make things simpler, I already mentioned this quickly, but in order to make things simpler, I will discuss in my talk only Floque systems, so systems which are periodic, periodically driven. I mean, this is just in order to make time discrete. So my time is now just measured in multiples of fundamental drive period. So imagine now you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, depends uh, periodically on time, period without the loss of generality can be chosen to be one. So now we take a time a time ordered propagator from zero to one, and that is what is called a Floque operator. So dynamics now is just iteration of this Floque operator. I have not specified anything about the nature of the Hamiltonian. Should be, could be a single particle, could be many body. Uh, I will discuss later many body Hamiltonians, but for the moment this is completely abstract. So consider this uh, uh, Floque dynamics, and now you can consider its spectrum. The spectrum is, for example, written now in terms of the eigenphases because it is a unitary, unitary uh, uh, operator. Its eigenvalues are unimodular. So you can write its phases. We call them phi n, uh, we call them quasi-energies. And the density is described, is, is defined like this. So this is a one-point function. If you want spectral density, 
And uh, the two point function is described by this object, which is just uh, rho rho, I mean, at different places, shifted by theta, averaged over the midpoint, which is defined. Yeah? So now this is what I call a little r of theta, which is now uh, uh, called a two point function or spec pair pair correlation function of the spectrum. It's, it is a connected correlation function, so I subtract the average density. And average density is equal to one by the nature of the normalization here. So, uh, and then what people usually do here is they take a Fourier transform of this pair correlation function and doing Fourier transform is very easy. It's a two line calculation. And what, what one gets is basically a, a, a double sum over the spectrum of these phases, which are just propagating like e to the i times t, e to the i t times the uh, eigenphase. Uh, minus the, the other eigenphase. So uh, level sum. So this is just a trace of the propagator to power t modulo square, right? So I mean, this is a really, really nice representation of the correlation function or of the Fourier transform of the correlation function, the so-called spectral form factor. I will call it k of t in terms of dynamics. So it is just a trace of the modulus square. So modulus square of the trace of the propagator. Now there is this delta function at time equal to zero. I mean, sometimes it is, is related to what people call uh, initial plateau and then decay of the spectral form factor. Now time is discrete, so there is no plateau and no decay in the no, sorry, not plateau, but decay uh, of the spectral form factor in the beginning is just a delta function at equal to zero, which is a weight n square. And now curly n is the dimension of the Hilbert space. So this is again still abstract. So it's any finite dimension of Hilbert space, uh, curly n. And time is discrete, of course. It's a Fourier variable corresponding to quasi-energy, which is periodic from zero to pi. So now you imagine now spectrum is just a gas in on a box of period two pi. It's a periodic box. Uh, you take a Fourier transform of the spectral density of the pair correlation of that gas, and then you get uh, what is uh, you know depending on an integer variable because the periodicity of space. And this integer variable is just time, it's number of repetitions of the fundamental uh, period of the Floquet drive. Okay, so now uh, this is all nice. Uh, and uh, uh, now the question is how to compute that. I mean, now it's related to dynamics. There is no dependence on any particular state. So it's very abstract, it doesn't depend on state, it just depends on dynamics. Uh, you could also consider this as a kind of a random state. I mean, trace of the uh, propagator can also be considered as an average of random states. So try to start from a random state uh, and ask what is the amplitude that you return to the same random state after time t. And then you, uh, you compute uh, this uh, modulus square of this amplitude, so the probability to return. <clears throat> now, this, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have much sense if you compute this object, because usually it is highly oscillating, uh, for example, as a function of time. So what people have to do is to consider some sort of averaging. I mean, this object, what is known in, in the jargon of the random matrix theory, is not self-averaging. Uh, also in random matrix theory, as we see, is not self-averaging. So it means it doesn't make sense. Its fluctuations are of the order of its average. Uh, so one has to compute at its, at its average somehow. And now in dynamical systems, this means one has to average over some parameter of the model, or sometimes it's enough even to average over time. So like taking small time steps, um, small time windows, much smaller than the absolute time, and then just average over these time windows, like 1% of the time and so on. This is already enough to make this object usually well defined. <clears throat> now remember, now what we will be after in the first part of my talk, we will be after computing this this, this, this spectral form factor, which is a two replica kind of uh, object, right? It depends on uh, two copies of the system, it's like trace of u squared. Uh, so it's trace of u, trace of u conjugate, trace of u to the t, trace of u to the conjugate. And uh, yeah, and then you will have to do, on top of that, we'll have to do expectation value. So that will be simple, simple exercise, let's say, in the StatMec uh, context, how to compute this spectral form factor. Yeah, and that will be <clears throat> sort of the first part. But before going there, I mean, let me just give you a little bit more of, of background on spectral form factors in random matrix theory and in semi-classical chaos. Now, first in random matrix theory, and this is something that really we want to have because we want to compare to random matrices. I mean, the quantum chaos conjecture is about comparing, comparing uh, spectra of dynamical systems to random matrix spectra. So random matrix theory tells us that spectral form factor can be easily computed and, uh, and it has simple, simple uh, behavior. It has this so-called uh, linear ramp at the beginning of times. And uh, of course, unless, uh, except for time equal to zero, which we forgot, now we start at time positive. At time positive in random matrix theory, spectral form factor is linear if uh, your matrices have no particular symmetries. For example, there is no time reversal symmetry, no anti-unitary symmetry, 
we should consider unitary matrices. In this case, is this so-called Dyson uh, circular unitary ensemble. And then spectral form factor is just a linear function of slope one up to time t equal to n, uh, where n is the dimension of the Hilbert space. This is the so-called Heisenberg time. After this so-called Heisenberg time, and this uh, here I have again definition of spectral form factor, but I forgot to put t, I'm sorry for that. So this is t, t times the difference of eigenvalues. And now when the difference of neighboring eigenvalues becomes of the order of, uh, uh, I mean, it's of the order of two, two pi over n. So when time becomes of the order n, this becomes of the order of two pi. So even the smallest difference of eigenvalues is of the order of two pi. Then it means I can consider all these all these phase differences as pseudo random numbers. And that means this is a random sum. And once it is a random sum, there could be no systematics anymore. So it should fluctuate, fluctuate around the constant value. So it means that for times larger than n, this spectral form factor should be a flat function, should be constant. It's of the order of n. Uh, and before that, it has a ramp. Yeah? So for unitary ensemble, there is just this linear ramp and then the constant. Yeah? Now for yes. other ensembles, for example, for orthogonal ensemble, which is associated to systems with anti-unitary symmetry. In physics, this is usually the time reversal symmetry. Then this uh, spectral form factor should grow with a slope, which is twice t, 2t in the beginning. And then it has a smooth crossover smooth crossover given by this uh, uh, continuous function, this smooth function uh, 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 to a plateau. Again, uh, now the higher derivative of this function is not continuous at Heisenberg time, but the first derivative it is, so it looks like smooth, uh, smooth function. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I only quote it four times less, less than Heisenberg time. And uh, let's forget about other ensembles like symplectic ensembles, which, not, which will not be relevant for my talk. Okay, so now uh, this is all nice, but of course, you when you go to physics and compare to random matrix theory, what you typically find is that there is a, another time scale. There is this time scale tau, uh, Heisenberg time, which I already mentioned, which is only given in terms of the dimension of the Hilbert space. So, I mean, this is usually also related to some, I mean, at least in semi classics, it's related to effective Planck constant. I mean, the dimension of the Hilbert space is related to inverse Planck constant to the number of degrees of freedom. Right, so it's basically giving you the number of degrees of freedom and effective Planck constant. But now there is another time scale, usually in physics, which is called uh, often referred to as the Tauless time or Ehrenfeld time, depending on the context. And this time is the time below which, before which, uh, spectral form factor cannot be written, uh, cannot be given by random matrices. Uh, I mean, spectral form factor of a given physical system cannot be given in terms of random matrices because at very short times you can, you know, system has its own characteristics. I mean, then you have model dependent dynamics. So spectral form factor for times shorter than tau less time depends on the type of dynamics that you have. For example, when you have diffusive dynamics, then there is diffusive time scale, which is given in terms of time, which is needed in order to, for diffusion to spread all over the accessible configuration space. So for example, for systems with diffusion, this will be proportional to L squared, where L is the system size. And if this is a many body system, uh, Heisenberg time is proportional to exponential L. So there's a huge range between L square and exponential L, of course. But for other systems which have no conserved charges, uh, this tauless time is usually even shorter than diffusion, shorter than L square. It's maybe not even growing with L or with a growth like log L. Uh, for example, in models like SYK model, uh, <clears throat> and so on. So I mean, uh, I don't want to discuss this now at this moment uh, how it behaves for different types of dynamics. But I just want to stress there is a second time scale. And in dynamical systems, in physical models, you have to worry about this other time scale. So random matrices can only apply after this tauless, so-called tauless time. Okay, now uh, let me give you one slide on how people discuss this uh, spectral form factor for systems with classical limit for few body systems or for single body systems, if you want, with classical limit. Uh, then of course, one can connect this uh, to chaos, to hyperbolic dynamics, to positive Lyapunov exponents, and you know, butterfly uh, effect chaos, right? So now uh, <clears throat> uh, the first order of this spectral form factor has been already uh, given by, by, by Michael Berry in his uh, paper on eight, from, from 81, uh, 85 uh, within the approximation, which is uh, kind of random phase approximation, which he called diagonal approximation. So the idea is very simple. I mean, as you have maybe uh, remembered, the spectral form factor is a trace of uh, uh, u to the t modulo squared. So it's basically trace of u to the t times trace of u to the t conjugate. And now if you use uh, 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 a path integral representation of the propagator and uh, settle point uh, 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 approximation to evaluate this path integral, 
in semi-classical limit, then you can write this in terms of uh, saddle, uh, sum of, of saddles, and each saddle is associated to classical trajectory. So uh, its phase is given in terms of the action along classical trajectory, and then there is corresponding amplitude. So the trace of u to the t is basically given in terms of the sums over all periodic trajectories of p at t, or I call it tau here, and uh, all plus classical trajectories with certain action in certain period. Now, trace of u to the t is double sum of the actions. And then what Barry, Barry argued that these sums are highly oscillatory. I mean, these actions are large in terms of h bar. So these phases are oscillatory. And the only way for this to compensate, to, to constructively interfere, is to take uh, pairs of orbits for which actions are the same. And this can either be that these orbits are, have to be the same, uh, I, or these orbits have to be the same or time reversal of each other. So depending on whether system has time reversal symmetry or not, there is this factor of two. For time reversal symmetric systems, there is a factor of two uh, because of the, yeah, as what I just said, I mean, orbits paired, not only pair only with themselves, but also with their, their time, time reversed factors. And then there is the sum over the amplitude squared, uh, which due to classical ergodicity, is given just as a as a st. I mean, this is again uh, a sum rule which people have uh, shown. It's easy to, to show. The so called Osorio de Almeida Hanai sum rule. Uh, and uh, now uh, this is the first step in showing that uh, chaotic classical chaotic dynamics have random matrix spectral statistics. Right. This is the first result from eighty five. Right. Very simple. Now it took a long time after people realized how to do the next step. It's uh, first piece was simple, but it was very heuristic. And to do systematically the next step took people a long time. And then it was only in 2001 when Zibar and Richter realized that the next uh, corrections in, let's say, each bar expansion of this double sum come from orbit pairs, which correspond to these self encountering, self -encountering orbits. So, uh, and I will not go into detail here because that's not of my point of my talk. But I want to say that you know uh, a couple of years later, then uh, Sebastian Miller. Uh, a PhD student in the group of Fritz Hacke uh, realized how to compute all the all the all the uh, uh, terms in this expansion. So basically, <clears throat> after these people understood how to reproduce vector compactor to all orders in expansion in H bar, or if you want expansion in T. So they basically gave uh, obtained a, a power law expansion which produces random matrix statistics you know, to all orders. Okay, but you know. Uh, I want to do immediately a disclaimer here now. I mean, this I'm not talking about uh, large uh, n or small h bar physics here. I'm talking about, I will talk about uh, uh, systems which are there is no cell points. Um, so high, uh, completely non perturbative uh, uh, setups. Uh, I will speak about systems well, like this systems where uh, uh, h bar is of, the, of, of effective h bar is of the order one. So these are condensed matter systems of fermions or spin one halves. So this is a typical model that people used in condensed matter uh, already since early 90s. Uh, uh, and I mean, what they did, what they computed level statistics of this type of models. And they argued these models are chaotic as soon as level statistics was around the matrix. And this is an example of models like this. So this is a hopping model. I mean, spinless fermions on a 1D lattice, uh, uh, nearest neighbor, next to nearest neighbor hopping uh, or tunneling. And nearest neighbor and next to nearest neighbor interaction, density density interaction. And uh, when the next to nearest neighbor terms are zero, this model is uh, 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 identical to Heisenberg XXZ, a spin one half chain, which is in a paradigmatic integrable system. So spectral statistics is possible. Uh, as soon as you break this integrability parameters, uh, J prime, V prime, you go quickly to a, a statistics which is Wigner Dyson. <clears throat> So now uh, this has been uh, around with, with, with the community, at least with the condensed matter community since, uh, since early, early, early 90s. But uh, to my kind of uh, astonishment, nobody really tried to explain that. I mean, uh, I carried this problem around for, I, say, I would say personally like 25 years and I was thinking about this, but you know, I, I didn't, didn't see any other you know, really concerned uh, researcher in the literature, right? I mean, why, why should it be so? I mean, for me, it was completely bizarre, right? You have a, a many body Hamiltonian with uh, exponentially large dimension, two to the L, and this is highly securely sparse. There are only two to the L, there are only L, that is log of two to the L uh, elements uh, in each row or each column. So the sparsity is exponentially small and there is no randomness. I mean, uh, there are only few parameters which are not random and still the statistics of, of, of correlations of, uh, among energy levels are described by random matrices. So what is the mechanism, right? Clearly the mechanism cannot be as simple as the one uh, discussed in semi-classical chaos. So, I mean, that is what, what we were after. 
Yeah. <clears throat> to find uh, mechanisms to explain, to explain random matrix statistics of many body systems without any small parameters. Okay, so maybe if there is any question, I mean, now basically I, I discussed my, my, main, my main problem and uh, maybe <clears throat> if there's any question, please uh, interrupt. Otherwise, any I questions? Continue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. And then I go on. So now let's go now to Floquet systems. I mean, this were like how many systems, but my talk is about Floquet systems. Uh, as I said already in the beginning, I think Floquet systems are conceptually easier because uh, there is no Hamiltonian, meaning there is not even a single conserved charge, right? I mean, now we are talking about theories without conserved charges and Hamiltonian theories have at least one conserved charge, which is the first integral, which is the energy. So now Floquet systems have not even energy conserved. So in that sense, it's simpler, right? So uh, uh, that's why we prefer to start with systems which we call kicked systems or Floquet systems, which are periodically driven in terms of delta pulse interactions, like this model, which I will discuss, which I will introduce in the next slide, but I'm just giving you a, a, a data for uh, a, a, an empirical data, how the spectral form factor looks like for this model. This is from our paper from 2007. Uh, uh, as you see, I mean, this is just to illustrate non-self-averaging feature of spectral form factor. If you ask a student, a graduate student, to compute spectral form factor and plot it as a function of time, he will bring you this plot, you know, which is just this, 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 this sand, right? Doesn't make any sense. But then, of course, what he can do is either now this is no averaging over any any family of models. This is just local time averaging. So what he can do now is just do local time averages over windows of time, let's say, of the width of one percent. Like this is, a, I don't know, this is a spin chain of 18 spins. This is a couple of 10,000 levels. So if you just ask, uh, you know, to, to bin over 100 adjacent time steps, then what you get is this, 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 this curves or these symbols on top uh, behind. And then this model has a translation invariance. So if you also average over a pseudo momentum, uh, 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 then you get this continuous curve, this black curve, and then it excellently agrees with the random matrix prediction, which, which is the red curve. So this is just to show that, you know, a simple, spin chain, which I'll be discussing in my next slides, already uh, is described by random matrix theory to a high, high accuracy. But if, of course, you know, in order to, to discuss spectral form factor, one has to be careful in analyzing data. So, I mean, that's why, you know, people would, uh, in numerical uh, experiments, they would uh, much prefer to discuss spectral level spacing than spectral form factor, because level spacings are, are nicely self-averaging quantity, right? The histograms are, 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 are self-averaging. But, uh, but from for the, from theoretical point of view, it's basically that maybe uh, nicer. I mean, the spectral form factor is a nicer quantity; it's a pure two point function, so it's it's easier to to, to analyze. So I mean, it's a trade off, right? I mean, for a theoretician, spectral form factor is nicer. For numerical computational physicist, uh, level spacings are nicer. But you know, let's start with, uh, with the simplest uh, simplest uh, conceptually simplest quantity, which is the two point function between the spectral form factor. Okay, so now. <clears throat> Uh, there are a couple of papers that appeared only recently which that address this problem. Uh, I don't want to discuss these papers because they are not, again, they are not exact in the sense they meet some assumptions. And uh, my point here in this talk is that they are exactly solvable models, right? So I'm just discussing exactly solvable features. So but I just want to mention there was a paper from our group uh, in 2018, and there were papers from Oxford Group uh, from John Chopper and company. Uh, which actually considered so again some sort of asymptotic limit, so they had some sort of small parameter, uh, local Hilbert space dimension. But anyways, I mean these were, to my knowledge, the first models which considered the problem of spectral correlations in many body systems um, from the theoretical point of view. Okay, but now what about systems with local interactions? I mean, and smaller spin areas we not have, right? I mean, uh, now let me define this kicked isink model, which will be the first model that we will discuss. Uh, it's probably the simplest model of this type. Uh, it's kind of, yeah, <laughs> you cannot get simpler than that, right? You take easing model, 1D easing model, uh, with uh, potentially uh, longitudinal, longitudinal fields. And these fields could be positionally dependent. So I would like to break all symmetries. So I'd also like to break translation invariance, just in order not to worry about conserved uh, or quasi momentum. Uh, so uh, I will just take uh, 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 some random or yeah, some, some, some small random fields, if you want, uh, longitudinal fields. And then I will take also transverse fields. <clears throat> so I will take the uh, uh, easing interaction with longitudinal fields. Uh, and then I would periodically kick, periodically switch on uh, uh, with a periodic delta function uh, uh, transverse fields. 
So then this leads to a Floca, a Floca propagator, which is just product of two exponentials, right? Uh, time order product now is just product of the exponentials, uh, and namely the easing part uh, composed with the kick part. <laughs> now the, this model has basically two key parameters, two key coupling constant. One is the uh, easing interaction J, and the other is the transpose field P. <clears throat> and then of course there is this uh, longitudinal field, but this longitudinal field will turn out to be completely irrelevant uh, parameter. So uh, the results that I present will be true for any non-zero value of the variance of the longitudinal fields. <laughs> Namely, let's first discuss this model uh, without longitudinal fields. So without longitudinal fields, this model is integrable. Namely, uh, a transfers kicked transfers field uh, a kicked is model is uh, equivalent to free fermions. I mean, you can do Wigner Jordan transformation and map it to free fermions and then solve it by a Bogolivo transformation. Or if you take zero uh, transverse field, of course, then this is just a classical Lisbon model uh, in 1D. Again, it's integral. <clears throat> so, but for generic values of H, J, and B, this model has no symmetries and it's not integral. And uh, uh, excuse right. me, can I ask a question? Yes, so please. Is it important to keep J and B homogeneous in your setup? Uh, yes, for mm -hmm. in my set setup it is because they will have to have particular values. Uh, in general setup, no. I mean, in, in specific setup, because in order to proceed uh, to do uh, explicitly the disorder averaging, uh, uh, yes, J and B has to be has to be uh, fixed because they will have to have specific values. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so now let me just uh, continue with some uh, well definition of what we do, what we want to do. So we want to now compute the expectation, the expectation value of the spectral form factor uh, where the average is done according to IID Gaussian distributed longitudinal fields. So it's a Gaussian integral average with a Gaussian kernel. Uh, all the fields are independent, normal, normally distributed Gaussian variables with uh, variance uh, sigma. Uh, uh, standard deviation sigma, variance sigma squared, and mean h, h bar. <clears throat> now, if you do numerics, if you just do Monte Carlo numerics, just average this uh, this this quantity uh, over a sample of a sample of a couple of ten thousand uh, realizations, that what you get is this is this plots, right? Depending on the variance, I mean, the smaller the variance, uh, the larger the variance, the the the, the more uh, the less fluctuating numerics you you get. But in principle, what you get is basically a very nice agreement with spectral, with random matrix theory. This is for spin chain of size 15. And the agreement here is perfect, but you see also linear ramp, right? You don't see any, 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 any saturation yet because the times are still much shorter than the Heisenberg time, which in this case is like two to 15, like 30,000. <clears> now it's very short time there is uh, increased fluctuations, but it turns out that these increased fluctuations are decreasing when you go to thermodynamic limits. So when you increase the chain life sense, ch chain size, they become smaller and smaller. So basically, sorry, uh, basically these fluctuations are completely uh, benign. I mean, they appear for finite systems and they appear for finite samples, but they decrease with sample size and with, with, with system size. <clears throat> so the condition to get this nice data is that these parameters, the coupling parameters, J and B has to have absolute value equal to pi over four. And I, it will be clear in my next slide why this pi over four is so important, but it turns out that, you know, uh, I mean, this is the only point where you can make this averaging exactly also analytically. And in this point, uh, you will have this feature, which I mentioned in the introduction and in the motivation slide, uh, this feature of dual unitarity, that uh, this model could be understood as unitary theory in space and time. <clears throat> so now, uh, now what we would li like to do next, we would like to compute this expectation value of spectral form factor as a partition sum of a 2D like of the 2D classical statistical model. So it's a, a kind of a 2D statistical model. And the spectral form factor is like a partition sum of this statistical model. And uh, the computation of this partition sum is feasible only when this spectral, para, spectral uh, coupling constants are pi over four. So uh, in this case, I cannot afford them to be uh, inhomogeneous. <clears throat> Let me, okay, so now before I go to uh, some more general models, I will just give you some, I will just quote the result without well, I will just show you one slide how to prove it, but not really going into any detail. But uh, what we can show, for example, is for odd times, again, in this model, we have to restrict for odd types only, for even times, we only can make conjecture. But for odd times, we can show that this uh, disorder average spectral form factor in thermodynamic limit is precisely equal to the random matrix theory value, which is 2T. <clears throat> Except if time is less than or equal to five, when you have a small time correction, which is 2T minus one. 
So which means that the error phase time or hours time is of the order one here, and it doesn't scale with system size at all. And that's the only reason why we can compute this in thermodynamic limit, right? I mean, if the tallest time would scale with system size, then in thermodynamic limit, we could not compute uh, as simple as, as that. Right, so now, uh, uh, right, so now this is um, sort of the, 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 the summary of this result. So results, you know, uh, here, this, the statement of this theorem does not depend on the, on the, on the variance of the disorder, sigma. So it is true for any value of the disorder, and we can take even the limit of the disorder going to zero at the end of calculation. Of course, the thermodynamic limit and the disorder to zero limits don't commute. So it's important to take the disorder limit at the end, but this result is not, uh, uh, I mean, there is no transition if you want from ergodic to localized phase when you change the disorder strength. This model is, uh, um, is, 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 is disordered, is, is ergodic for any value of the disorder strength. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, as 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 a, as a summary of this of this of this result, I mean, I could uh, say that we found a simple locally interacting model with finite dimensional local Hilbert space, for which we can prove random matrix spectral fluctuations at all time scales. So, I like to think of these models as critical chaotic systems. I mean, critical in the sense that there are no no time scales. Right. I mean, the only time scale it was Heisenberg time, but this was sent to infinity when we took thermodynamic limits. So, there is no no really physical time scales uh, where, we, where there, anything would change. It's basically a ring with random matrices at all times. <clears throat> okay, now Excuse me. one slide. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? So yeah. could you go one slide back? And uh, yeah, let me just make sure the theorem only holds for particular J and B, right? It's exactly, it only holds for J equal to B is equal to pi over four in absolute. Okay, 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 thank you. And again, I will explain why. I mean, I'll, I'll try to okay. explain now uh, first yeah. in this slide. There's so the idea question. now, yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, um, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so actually I'm curious about the um, Frock MBL. And uh, so is it very, how to say, um, is it uh, obvious or is it trivial that the, there is no Frock MBL for this kind of simple model? Uh, look, I mean, uh, the statement is very much weaker. I mean, the statement is there is no Frock MBL at j equal to b equal to pi over four, which is the maximally chaotic one. Ah. Uh -huh. Around this, there could be no MBL. You cannot have any localization uh, 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 produced by this order. I see. You uh, mean that this is go big... away. yes? You mean you mean this is very special for su such parameter, right? This is very special for such parameters. Yes. In I the see. next, I... the end of my talk will be basically then arguing that maybe uh, there is a finite ball around this parameter point for uh -huh. which you can also have the same physics, yeah? but maybe just the finite ball. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Now, what we have now is just a particular point in which we can have no, we can we cannot have localization, yeah. <clears throat> and this 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 feature is due to this feature of dual unitarity, which I will now come to. So now let's 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 just you know this is just an idea. I mean, just you know to give you a a, a, a brief uh, picture of behind this, right? The idea is to, as I said, I mean, the idea is to write this trace of the propagator, trace of u to the t, as a partition sum of a two state two D statistical model. And uh, in this case, this 2D statistical model is just a 2D easing model in a random field. Namely, if you write this, I mean, I, I didn't write this in my slide, but it's, I welcome anyone who wants to try. I mean, it's an easy computation. It's also in our paper, but uh, I wrote it in the, in the title. But uh, so the idea is to write this as a partition sum of 2D, uh, 2D, 2D uh, easing model. And then you see this partition sum can be contracted along rows or in columns, right? If it's contracted along columns, column transfer matrix is just a Floki propagator. But the row transfer matrix, because this is a 2D easing model, has exactly the same algebraic form. Again, has a form of an easing model in 1D, right? I and mean, this is this duality between uh, statistical mechanics, statistical physics, and quantum physics in you know, one dimension less, right? You can just uh, contract uh, uh, this in two directions. And in the other direction is, again, algebraically the same model, this uh, physics model. But with slight, with potentially different parameters, which I will denote as J tilde and B tilde. So now I call this propagator U tilde. It now acts on spin chain of size T, and you have to apply it L times. And of course, it uh, it depends on magnetic field, and magnetic field is now constant because it's the same at all times, but it depends on space, right? So now you see, I mean, the disorder now maps to a noise, to a noisy homogeneous field, right? Right, so now I have this uh, partition sum which you can write in two ways, either like this, like a row transform, column transform matrix, 
or like this or like row transform matrix. Yeah? The difference now, the change is the main change is that you have to flip the, 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 the coupling parameters J and B to what I call here J tilde and B tilde. And now it so happens that only at particular points, which is J equal to big pi over four, also J tilde and B tilde are real. So U tilde is unitary. And in all other cases, J tilde and B tilde will be complex. So U tilde will no longer be unitary. And whenever this U tilde is unitary, then we can actually compute this using two replicas. I mean, like write another replica of trace of U to the T and takes, take the expectation value because now we can take expectation value locally in space. And then we can iterate it to power L, take the thermodynamic limit and we have just, you know, we just have a transfer matrix over from which we have to just compute the, 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 the leading eigenvalue and the gap, right? <clears throat> to show that the gap is positive and the leading eigenvalue gives us the, 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 the behavior in thermodynamic limit. <clears throat> okay, now I just give you sort of the construction words, but now I will give you construction for a more broad family of models uh, with a cartoon. And this cartoon will be much more general. So I decided to just give you this other cartoon. But first I have to define, define this more general class of models. This more general class of models will include Kirchhoff's model as a special case, and will basically give us the whole family of models for a certain number of local degrees of freedom, like qubits or qubits. Um, <clears throat> and so we will basically explore, I mean, all models of this type. <clears throat> so these models are the dual unit, dual unitary systems. So we start from the circuits. I mean, these are models are written as circuits, so as uh, locally interacting. Uh, Arrays of two, two, two qubit quantum gates, or two qubit quantum gates. So let's start with quantum gates. So quantum gate is a, 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 a unitary matrix uh, acting on the tensor product of two local spaces. So it's dimension d square. So it maps two, two states i and j to states k and l. So you can read of it uh, like this, but now I will read time in the vertical and space in horizontal direction. So uh, time wise, it, 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 acts, it maps i j to k l. And space-wise, it, it maps IK to JL. So uh, now what I did already implicitly, I defined also the, the space transfer matrix, which I denoted as, as U tilde. So this reshuffle. I just do reshuffling, reshuffling of indices. That's basically, in other words, this is just what some people would call a partial trace composed with, uh, with a swarm, right? So it's, uh, and in quantum information theory, sometimes this is in, really called uh, index reshuffling. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> So now what I define now is the utility gate. And now what I ask from, you know, that what I ask from these two gates in order to be dual unitary, I ask them that the gate, original gate is unitary, but also that the, the dual gate, the space gate is, is unitary as well, right? So now this condition, of course, is stronger condition than unitarity. And this condition gives us extra constraints on the gate. Yeah? And if you have such a gate, then also the circuit you build out of those gates is dual unitary, meaning that the space dynamics is also unitary. So, now you start from uh, gates, you place them on a lattice. Uh, so you take, L, so now this is lattice of size 2L, everything should be even, right? Size 2L and time, which is again, uh, the number of uh, depths of the circuit should be even. So the number of Floquet steps is, 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 is layer, uh, is, is depth two. So this is one Floquet step. So this would be like two Floquet steps, uh, six uh, basic cells, so uh, <clears throat> 12 spins, uh, for, 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 for layers in time. But now you can read it like, 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 like space dynamics, like, like time dynamics in vertical direction or like space dynamics in horizontal direction. And uh, due to what I just told you, I mean, both uh, circuits, now this W is uh, the full map of the circuit, the full uh, one time step of the circuit is unitary map. Uh, and U tilde is also unitary map, but now on a time lattice, on a lattice of two T uh, classical spins Right, uh, which are defined now yeah, with respect to time. So, uh, and now we have this what we call duality of traces, which is just you know this could be understood as a partition sum with some periodic boundary conditions, for example. Sorry, this partition sum, and then there is uh, two ways in which we evaluate this partition sum, either via propagator in time or via propagator in space. And now. Uh, just to give you motivation, why should maybe one be uh, interested or excited about this, is that there are very simple and very uh, big families of uh, gates which satisfy these conditions already for qubits. Uh, for example, for qubits, uh, <clears throat> we can completely classify these dual unitary gates 
there is a general classification of two qubit gates, which is written like this. So for uh, this is a um, uh, unitary matrix of dimension four, can be written as a Heisenberg gate, which has three parameters, and uh, four and four SU two gates, which each have three parameters. So it's three plus three plus three plus three plus three is five times three is, is 15, plus a all over face is 16 parameters, which is four square, which is the complete set of three parameters for U4. Now, I mean, this is the uh, unique representation of U4, but it happens now that if only you fix two out of three parameters in Heisenberg gate, like you take pi over four, pi over four and arbitrary J, you can choose arbitrary pair of two, right? Because of the, you know, you can realize uh, cyclic permutations in terms of these SU2s. So this is the unique choice, which fixes this uh, uh, U4 to be now a sub-manifold, which is dual unitary sub-manifold. So this, uh, if you fix these two parameters to pi over four, this means that U, not only U is unitary, but also U3 is unitary. So this gives us a complete classification of dual unitary gates in dimension two, I mean, in uh, local dimension two. This is nice, but you know, it's the only result we have. Namely, we don't have equivalent results for higher uh, qubit qubit dimensions. But this result already is rich. I mean, it has some many uh, relevant, interesting examples. For example, a trivial example is a swap gate. A slightly less trivial example is the six vertex gate or XXZ gate, a particular value of parameter. And the less trivial, least, tri least trivial, most interesting example is our previous model, a self dual fictising model. Self dual now means that it has this pi over four, pi over four, pi over four uh, coupling constants. Uh, again, this can be written as a circuit in terms of these gates. As you see, this parameter j now is equal to value zero. So this j here basically is, uh, uh, it turns out, is related to entangle, entangle, entangling or entanglement power of the gate. And the entanglement power is the higher, the smaller the j. So j zero is the high, the strongest entangling, entangling power of the gate, which means that also the, this, the, the, this, this, this kind of uh, system, I mean, v of zero will be the most chaotic, let's say. <clears throat> I mean, the gates produced from, from uh, dual unitaries with j equal to zero are the most chaotic, and j equal pi over four is the least chaotic, which is the swap, which is the non-interacting. So this j is a nice kind of chaos parameter which controls the degree of entanglement that can be produced by these dual, dual unitary circuits. And g, g, j is zero is the most chaotic uh, <coughs> situation. And uh, this, these constructions have been generalized, for example, to arbitrary q dits, but then of course it only gives a subset of dual unitaries for qubit gates in this nice paper by, by, by Peter Claes and Austin Lamacraft. And also the kick teasing model have been generalized by a group of uh, Goodkin and Thomas Gore uh, to higher the, <coughs> to higher local dimension. Um, yeah, but I will not discuss this, I mean, due to lack of time, but I'm just giving this as a small, um, uh, small, small uh, <coughs> classification result. Now, let, let us go back to spectral form factor. Let me see how much time do I have. Oh, I'm when, when I'm supposed to finish. Um, you have one hour in total, so but one hour uh, in total. But I'm supposed to finish maybe at least five ten minutes before, no? no, no I, I think three minutes before. But okay, uh, okay. yeah, you can yeah you can keep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So now maybe I, I I speak for ten more minutes. Yeah, so I'll try to speed up for the for the last part. So, but okay. So let me just just give you the, the, the general setup in which we can prove spectral form factor to match random matrix theory. Now it's given in terms of dual unitary circuits. So now let's take a dual unitary circuit where you have two layers of dual unitary gates, like these red gates. And these two, two gates can be different, but they will be the same. So the interactions will be translation invariant. So there is these two gates, one is U, the, the other is W, the, the, the light red and dark red uh, square. And then uh, I take these blue single qubit gates, which could be different at different sides, which is like random fields, right? I mean, for qubits, uh, local gates can all be kind of generated by random fields, right? I mean, arbitrary random magnetic field can generate arbitrary SU2 rotation. So, I mean, you can just think of a random uh, random magnetic fields. We generate this, this, this random, random unit single qubit gates. But now that the distribution of these random fields could be arbitrary. Essentially, it turns out really almost completely arbitrary. The only, the only requirement is that it has a positive variance. So uh, it should not be constant, but it should be uh, IID random field with positive variance. <clears throat> okay, so now what we do now is basically again use this space-time duality. I, I, I re rephrase, so now this a spectral form factor now is a kind of an object which is a partition sum of a, of a system on a T by L lattice. 
So now T is the time steps, number of time, the time, L is the system size. You write this like this, but then you can write this as a tensor product, right? I mean, you write trace of the U to the T squared as a tensor product of U to the T times tensor product U to the T uh, transpose, and one is dagger, so or one is conjugate of the other if you want. And then you use uh, then you use basically this duality, which means uh, in terms of pictures, this definition basically means you have one replica and the other replica and then expectation value. But now this uh, expectation value now you can compute by contracting column wise because this order is only this order in space but not in time. So different points in time, uh, different points at, at fixed points in space, different points in time have constant field, constant disorder. So which means that if I if I now first okay, the, the other thing I have to do, but now I'm sorry I'm speeding up a bit. But the other thing I have to do is I have to fold the circuit back. Uh, so sorry is speeding up like itself. So now, <clears throat> uh, what the other thing we, ha we have to do, of course, we just do what is known as folded representation, or if you want, uh, in, in, in jargon of uh, field theory, it's sometimes called thermofield double representation. So we take two copies of Hilbert space and we write maps over operators as maps over states in, in, in this product Hilbert space. So uh, you just fold it back and then you write this as green gates, which now act on tensor product of two local Hilbert spaces. But now once you did that, then you can really do the local, uh, you know, you could do averaging locally if you define transfer matrices in uh, in space direction. So now this is space. So now this is one transfer matrix. And now what, what, what this is, I mean, this is just, as you see, this is just this, what I call KWT here. And now this is just transfer matrix to power L. So now what we have to show is that this transfer matrix has a gap in the spectrum and that the only eigenvalue of modulus one is equal to one. And that its uh, multiplicity is equal to t, because what we want to show that in thermodynamic limit, the spectral contact equals t. And this is indeed the case, and this is indeed possible to show. Uh, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> so now, I mean, of course, uh, I cannot now go into any detail of the proofs, but that proof is actually kind of, I mean, I think uh, interesting because it doesn't, uh, I mean, uh, the methods that we had to introduce to, 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 to show this. Are completely algebraic. I mean, they are not related to semi-classical chaos at all. I mean, or to any, you know, they have no. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's probably hard to say now in words what 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 I mean by that. But you know, it's the point is now it's a kind of quantum ergodicity proof. So basically, uh, <clears throat> what we have shown now is the spectral form factor is in thermodynamic limit only, right? Is equal to uh, a dimension of the commutant of a set of operators which are defined on time lattice. So the idea now is to show that time lattice is ergodic. So there is a process on a time lattice, a kind of Markov process on a time lattice, and we want to show it as ergodic. So we want to show that the only set of operators which simultaneously commute with the set of operators on a time lattice is uh, translations. And there are exactly T translations, right? Time lattice has, la said, has size T or 2T in fact, but it has period two. So it's periodic with period two on size 2T. So the only uh, symmetry operators which commute with all these elements, all the interactions on time lattice, uh, the, the only symmetry operators are translations and there are T translations. And this gives us the result that the spectral form factor is equal to. Okay, so now, uh, <clears throat> right. So now this is, uh, this is basically, and it's easy to show that this is, this is indeed the case, but uh, the difficult thing is to show that there are no other operators which commute with these guys. And the proof for that is very elementary. I mean, yeah, I don't want to, I mean, maybe at the end I can say something, but at the moment I have to speed up because I just want to, to, to discuss a second result, which is in fact much simpler, at least to show this is much simpler. Uh, the second result is uh, computation of spectral, uh, sorry, of the dynamical correlation functions for dual unitary circuits. For example, if, if uh, you compute, uh, if you want to compute uh, local correlators like this one, for example, uh, this is again Floki dynamics. So, uh, so uh, uh, there is no conserved charge, which means that the only invariant state which one needs to one can expect is the infinite temperature Gibbs state. There is no Hamiltonian though. So uh, then uh, the dynamical correlation function, uh, the equilibrium dynamical correlation function is essentially neutrally defined. It's just a threshold state average of this product of operators, the one propagated in time for time t, placed at position y. The other, the other place in position X. Uh, so there are two positions, X and Y, of two local operators, and then there is time of propagation of one with respect to another. So what we need to do at the end is to contract this, 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 this tensor network 
right? I mean, now these gates are dual unitary gates. This is like a tensor network. This is forward propagation. This is backward propagation. Uh, there are periodic boundary conditions in space and in time because lattice is assumed to be periodic in space, but then uh, trace means periodicity in time. And then what you have to do is you have to contract it. And there what you, what you use is this dual unitarity. So of course, unitarity immediately gives you the light cones, right? That this propagation of information from an operator, which is like a disturbance here, can spread only with speed one and minus one. So the correlations can only be non-zero if the other operator is placed for x minus y uh, less than t, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, less than t. But now we have dual unitarity, which means that uh, also the, the, the space propagation is unitary, which means that this operator also has to, be, has to be in this light cone, which opens in the space direction, right? And this is very intuitive now, I mean, I cannot show you the detail, the details to show the details is very simple. At the end of the day, what we show is that the only non-zero correlations can be between operators which sit exactly at the light ray. Right? Because the others, are the zero, the ones in the light, uh, outside the light cone in space and outside the light cone in time are zero. So the intersection of the two light cones is the two light rays, this one or, or the other one in the left direction. And then the spectral, the, the, the correlation function can be written in terms of the quantum channel. I mean, as you see, this is just an iteration of quantum channels. So apply to a beta uh, once, twice, three times, and so on. And then taking the product with the alpha and taking the trace. So this diagram, this tensor network for this diagram is just iterating this diagram, which I call M plus, uh, M plus, this plus is or plus or minus, meaning whether you put, I mean, depending on where you put the operator on the even and odd sublattice, if you put it on the odd sublattice, it goes this way, then you get F minus, M minus, and if you put it here, then you get M, M plus. <clears throat> so you see, I mean, now what you have is that correlations are zero unless operators sit exactly at uh, X minus Y equal plus minus T. And uh, then they are given in terms of quantum channels. And these quantum channels have a finite dimensional spectrum, finite dimensional uh, eigen, eigen, eigenvalue de uh, spectral decomposition. So then you can completely classify behavior of two quantum operations, <laughs> local operators, in terms of the spectrum of these quantum channels. So this is like a perfect Markovian. I mean, this is a, is, I think it's fair to, to say that the best interpretation of this is that this is a maximally chaotic dynamics with local interactions which is equivalent to kind of Markovian. So which means that the, the system uh, kind of acts to its qubits as perfect Markovian bar. So to each of its qubits, to each of its constituents, the rest of the system perfect, acts like a perfect Markovian bar. So uh, you can understand its relaxation in terms of Markov, uh, quantum Markov channels, quantum, quantum Markov channels. Okay, so now I think, again, as I have said, I have to speed up. So. Uh, you, you can classify this in terms of the spectrum of these quantum channels and depending on whether there are additional eigenvalues. There is always, eigen, there is always one eigenvalue equal to one, which corresponds to unit eigen operator. These are unital channels. I didn't say that, but they have to be unital because the correlators between one one has to be trivial. Uh, and then the other eigen operators are uh, either trivial or not. I mean, the eigenvalues are either on unit circle or not. If they are not, this dynamics is circuitic and mixing. Uh, all its local, all the local correlators will decay exponentially. Okay, now I'm just now flashing through some other things that one can compute using uh, for this uh, class of models. For example, one can compute quantum frequencies starting from a class of states which we call solvable, which are given in terms of matrix product states with particular uh, unitarity, unitarity conditions. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, starting from such, the such initial states, then you can compute uh, uh, expectation value for local operator uh, exactly at, for all times. Uh, what you can compute is also entanglement entropies for, uh, let's say, operator entanglement entropies or any two entanglement entropy in particular for dual interest circuits. You can show that uh, there is a nice phase transition uh, in terms of changing the strength of entanglement power, J, from zero where the entanglement, entanglement production is with maximum rate. Uh, so the, the, the production of any entropy per unit time here is the maximum, and it is twice larger, roughly twice larger than for random, random circuits of qubits. And then it goes decays, and then it becomes zero at the swap. But this this continuity is kind of uh, curious, and this is the infinite. This is exact analytic result, and this is numerics. Uh, <clears throat> now there are many other papers which I don't have time now to even mention, but uh, there are many other papers which use this concept recently of space-time duality to compute various interesting things. And uh, I was hoping to be able to tell you a bit on this uh, space uh, on this structural stability. 
I gave you the motivation on this in the in the in the my motivation motivating slide, but uh, I have no time to go into. Maybe I can give some answer in the, if there is some question later. But uh, I mean, <clears throat> I would just like to say this is a, I mean, to me, a very interesting problem to to, to discuss this structural stability because. I would agree. Everybody would agree. These are fine-tuned systems, right? Uh, and uh, if they are physical, if to be physically relevant, one has to understand how how sensitive they are to perturbations. We believe that there are some uh, contexts in which they are very robust, but uh, maybe these contexts are kind of kind of particular, so one has to discuss more. Um, for for example, one context, just to give you one slide, one context is consider non-dual interface circuits. Where you place impurities regular on a regular sublattice only one only once in a while. Sorry, uh, these green gates are dual unitary gates, but the blue, uh, sorry uh, orange gates, uh, yellow gates are dual unitary, but the green gates are not dual unitary; they're perturbed. And now, if perturbation is dilute in this space-time lattice, then you can basically uh, compute the space-time correlation function between two local operators, which is a partition sum in 2D, like a sum over quasi 1D partition sums, which corresponds to propagation along between A and B, along a path which scatters from impurity gates, which are non-dual unitary. I mean, as, yeah, I, I cannot use much more words to describe that, but, you know, there's uh, a couple of things that you could say still, but I want to skip that and uh, go to my conclusion. So my, 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 the point of my, my, my talk was to show that there are some exact uh, models, exactly solvable models for which you can prove uh, interesting results uh, in thermodynamic limit. So the point is that for all these results, uh, thermodynamic limit has to be taken first. So system has to be large enough. I mean, not maybe you should not, you may not, you may not need to take thermodynamic limit, but a system size should be larger than time, right? So that system never sees its boundaries. And the main challenge, for example, with one of the main challenges which I see for future work is to extend some of these results to finite systems or to see if they can be extended to finite systems. It seems very difficult at the moment, but why would be interested in that? For example, there is this uh, conjecture, which people call ETH, uh, which is about eigenstates and matrix elements of chaotic uh, many body systems. And the claim is that they behave randomly as uh, elements of random matrices. And um, <clears throat> the, the point, I mean, um, the way to show that would be, uh, I mean, the only way to show that my, my opinion is that uh, you know, one would be able to control this order of limits, time to infinity and L to infinity. And for showing TTH, one has to be able to take first large time and only that large, only then a large system size. But that's contrary to order of limits that we had to do in our uh, in our models so far. So it's kind of an interesting open question whether whether one can uh, extend these methods or at least partly to this other <clears throat> paradigm of of of, of, of ETH. So with this, I would like to thank for your attention and sorry for being a bit late. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tomas, for, for a very interesting talk. And now the session is open for que uh, questions and comments uh, from uh, the on-site participants. Yeah, please. I have a question. Uh, is this spectral form factor related to complexity of the quantum system? I, I believe yes. Uh, but what do you what do you mean by complexity? I mean, for example, I show you this this uh, uh, this uh, was light on uh, operator spreading, right? I mean, this is something that we can also show. Uh, but what what precisely do you mean by complexity? A precise meaning on uh, is uh, how 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 the system is uh, away from ordinary state in the Hilbert space. How the system what? How, how the uh, state is uh, far away from the original state after uh, the time uh, development. Right, so what, yeah, what people sometimes use uh, for that is this operator operator growth, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, operator growth we can show analytically, uh, for example, for, for, for any two of operator entanglement. For any two of operator entanglement, we can compute analytically for these models. And this is this is in this paper by the side post. Um, so the, yes, I mean the answer is yes. I mean we believe this these these models allow for exact exact computation of some you, you, you said that you believe uh it can we with not pardon? pardon, I didn't hear the last sentence. Can you repeat, please? Oh, I didn't is, hear. Is there, is there a proof? 
Well, uh, yeah, strictly strict answer is no. Uh, so for this result, we had to do some 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 slight assumptions. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the results are weaker in this in this in this in this sense. Uh, mm -hmm. The leaf result is exact, but we, it's not rigorous. I mean, we have not proven it. So there is still some assumption on which we rely. This uh, we have to rely. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, uh, so thank it's you. It's an interesting question, I think, to hmm. really prove. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, so any questions from the online participants? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. It was very beautiful. Um, so I I understand. Is, is it correct that uh, in your all of your example, you have some quenched randomness built in your model? Uh, no. Uh, uh -huh. This is only necessary. This is only necessary to compute uh, non-self-averaging quantities or like spectral form factor. Uh -huh. For computing, for computing op, uh, like correlation functions or uh, operator uh, entanglement, uh, uh -huh. these small, these circuits are clean. They have no randomness. Okay, so whenever you want to estimate KT, you yeah, but I'm sort of puzzled. But until I mean. Uh, okay, so there, there is a very clean non-random model that you talked about in the introduction, like non-integrable, and I Hubbard like model or spin system or yeah, whatever. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, so even in these clean models, if you just compute KT, you get a very bad result or? You get result which is noisy, but then if you average over time, you get a okay, okay. result which uh -huh. looks good. So uh, it's just very hard to formulate this precisely, right? Okay. Uh, okay. I think yes, 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 yes. It, eventually, I think it should be possible to also show something for clean system, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, I think it's much harder and it's much more difficult to precisely formulate what you want to show okay. because okay. Uh -huh. uh, the form factor does not exist. So mm -hmm. you have to average somehow. Yeah? All right. So your, your theorem for the moment applies to a model with some quenched randomness. Exactly. But exactly. it's only for for some technical reason that you want yes. to okay. And the averaging is the, the variance of the averaging is arbitrarily small but positive. Uh -huh. Okay. And the condition is that you take thermodynamic limit first before mm -hmm. you do everything with the variance. So so no matter how small this order, it's enough in thermodynamic limits to 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 give you random matrix statistics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But if the chairman allows, I want to ask about the stability oh, thing. Yeah, any other questions from other participants? Can I ask you one thing? Sure, sure. Um, is there any, any way you can map your uh, method to uh, so-called nonlinear sigma model method uh, developed by Efetov or some other people? I don't think so. I mean, at the moment, I, this is a very good, but uh, yeah, puzzling question was also, I mean, in general, I mean, uh, the general question uh, is if you can apply any of this to quantum field theory, right? Uh, because now what seems to be crucial here is this discreteness in space and time, uh, because you need unitarity of, uh, of the space propagator. And as, as soon as you go to continuum limit, you want to approach uh, trivial dynamics. I mean, <clears throat> when you, I mean, any discretization, any, any lattice discretization, when you go to small lattice uh, constant, uh, you have to go to throttle limit. You have to use throttle formula. And uh, this throttle formula would immediately uh, prohibit this, this dual unitarity because when you approach identity, identity in the dual, uh, dual of the identity is a projector, right? Uh, if you look at identities, just two arrows like this, but then if you look from this side, it's just projector. So, um, I mean, it's as, as non as, as non unitary as, as it can be. So, uh, I'm not sure if I, I'm I'm answering your question, but uh, I mean, now if you can think of some some relevant model which is like nonlinear sigma model but is discrete in space time, then we can discuss something. But uh, these continuum limits are very incompatible with, with with this. So it's a kind of different. I mean, I like to think of this as a kind of different universality class, uh, which is not compatible with doing the field limit, but. But maybe I'm wrong because, on the other hand, I mean it's yeah. I can give you my 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 misconceptual uh, intuition, but possibly misconceptual intuition, but maybe it's better I stop. Yeah. Thank it's you. a question. Thank you. So Tasek, would you like to ask another question? Yeah, 
Okay, yeah, I think everybody's curious about this stability, structural stability question. So what is the status? Do you have a theorem or? Yeah, we have one, we have one little theorem, right? Uh -huh. Which is uh, the following. Uh, I just described it in two minutes, if I may. Uh, <clears throat> so what we do is basically we, we not, I mean, what we can say is not for quantum circuit, but for a circuit which we built from quantum circuit after averaging over a random noisy uh, U1 external fields. So what we do is basically we compute two point function averaged over noisy fields, which are in fixed direction. So imagine you have these gates and on each space time lat, on each space time point, you put a random field H, J, T, J space T time uh, along Z direction. And then you average over this. Then what you do is in fact, you map quantum circuit to a classical Markov circuit. So now you get, what you get is a, uh, uh, is, is an uh, operator dynamics, which only acts uh, within diagonal subspace of operators. So it only mixes identity and sigma z. So it has just two dimensional local space and it is basically stochastic. So the, 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 the propagator now is a bi-stochastic matrix. And now if you, so it's like a, you know, it's like a circuit, but it's a circuit of Markov chains, classical Markov chains, local Markov chains. But now you can think of this as being uh, stochastic in space and stochastic in time. What we call dual by stochastic. Mm -hmm. That is it gives you some condition on these elements. So now if you write stochastic matrices in this Hadamard representation, they look like this, right? This is one, this is zero, 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 and there are some real numbers here. Mm -hmm. But now if for these uh, real numbers, if these two real numbers are zero, this will be dual by stochastic. Mm -hmm. Now you say, what happens if I put here an epsilon? Okay. Can I show something for, for this classical mark of dual by stochastic? Mm -hmm. And for this, we can show something, yeah. And for this, we can show something by, okay, there is some diagrammatics, but I uh -huh. cannot I don't really have time. But what we can show is that there is some, uh, basically we show with this by recursively diagonalizing the transform matrix and show that under some condition, we can claim that the leading eigenvalue doesn't change by growing the matrix. Mm -hmm. So basically you have a finite, you have a, a transform matrix of a two to the so size two to the L, two to the T in this case, is a transform matrix in, in time, in space direction, or in, in time, doesn't matter. I mean, it's, but uh, <clears throat> so it, the point is that there is the dimension of this, the, the, the number of sites. And when you grow the number of sites, the leading eigenvalue doesn't change. Hmm. So you have to be able to show that sometimes the leading eigenvalue is controlled, even if, when you grow the system. And this you can show under some condition, that under some condition of the parameters. Now you see this, this, this dual by stochastics are parameterized by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three parameters, all these guys are free. And now there is a condition on the six parameters, these two conditions on the six parameters uh, under which you can say that the leading eigenvalue of this transfer matrix is the grow. And then in this case, I mean, I'm now very sketchy, but in this case, you can contract this guy. Hmm. You see this guy means that you have impurities somewhere, but most of the time you have perfectly dual integrates. And yes. now in, at least you can do in the dilute limit. So there is another constraint, which is you have to do the dilute limit. Hmm. But in the root limit, you can do something, and then you can show that this can be written as a path integral, uh -huh. like a single particle path integral, mm -hmm. right? It's called like a path integral, but uh, very sketchy, right? So okay. this is a very kind of small result, uh, but I believe much more can be shown. But this uh -huh. is something. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> any other questions? So, if not, let's thank Tomas again. Thank you. <clears throat>